Jim Free, thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. Uh, you've just enthralled a few hundred people here at the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. The video does it all justice the video as does, well, you do yes. rely on that. Maybe just introduce, I asked a question during Q&A, just on the international partnerships and I suppose that is the uh, motivation to coming here to Western Australia and Perth and some of your key partners here. All right. We, so we, we have to tell our, we tell our story of going back to the moon as it's different this time because we're going with international partners. I think that's the first thing people have to understand is it's not the same and it's, that makes it better. It's better not just because we have so many diff diverse viewpoints, but we're touching people all over the moon, and that's all over the earth about going to the moon, and that's what exploration is. We're explorers by, by nature. So we came here this week to continue to expand our growing relationship with Australia in space through the Australian Space Agency, and also understand the capabilities that are being discussed here, because the further we get from home, we need those remote operations, but we need robotics to make things happen. And I suppose it's not just yourself leading the Artemis mission, but you've brought a couple of program managers, uh, David Korsmeyer as well. Uh, so this is multi-agency and within NASA itself, uh, multi-departmental. How does all that work together? How did sort of that con uh, NASA contingent come to Western Australia? So our uh, our deputy administrator, who visited Australia twice this year, uh, had the had the the vision to come up with exploration objectives. And those objectives are not just about what we're doing in human spaceflight. They're about what we're doing um, uh, across the entire agency with science as a focus. We need science. We need the technology. We need the experience of what we do in low Earth orbit. So we set up uh, an architecture based on those objectives that was built with the entire agency. That's never happened in the history of NASA. So the architecture that we have out there represents the entire agency. And our agency is the mission directorates and our centers. So the folks from the centers that are he centers that are here are about the folks that are executing the work and we're doing the planning and strategy to support them. And you, do you think the NASA itself, as well as the partners, are learning new ways to do business given the global nature of this and the number of partners involved? I think we'll continue to grow. So we have the International Space Station, which we have almost 23 years of dedicated flying in space together that we've learned so much from for international partners. Um, I think we're, we're continuing to grow that. These are challenging missions that we take on. It's not easy to fly in or low Earth orbit. It's also not easy to fly to the moon. So the more we work together, the more we build those dependencies, I think our knowledge of how we work together will continue to grow and get better. And maybe just a summary, you're now focused on Artemis Mission 2. Yes. And uh, you have 3, 4 and 5 up on screen. Maybe just some of the time frames involved with this uh, and by the time we do have uh, managed person, uh, people, humans, uh, on Mars. What's, what's your time frame for each of those mission phases? So Artemis 2, we're looking at the end of 20, 2024. Uh, Artemis 3, we're looking at the end of 25, although that's very ambitious right now with where we are in the development. And then we have uh, a little bit of a gap of a couple years till Artemis 4, and then we hope to be flying every year thereafter. Right. Um, and that knowledge of working on the surface is what we need before we go on to Mars, but that doesn't mean we can't way to, to work on the Mars systems today. So we're working on a lot of the subsystems yeah. today and we've there's been a lot of talk of tar targeting 2039 for a Mars mission. That's very aggressive. As strange as that sounds, it takes time to build these systems, but uh, we'd love to fly in 2039, but uh, right now we have to get our plan together for the moon and see how that support when we can go to Mars. Well, I think from industry, they want that, uh, not so much certainty, but longevity uh, is something they, they can start to invest in and right. partners can invest in. Uh, and that also uh, inspires the younger generation coming through that is within their time frame, uh, you know, whether they're young children now, they can potentially uh on the moon and Mars? Absolutely, yes. We, we need to give our industry and our international partners that signal of we're in this for the long term. Yep. So we set up those objectives to be politically resilient, financially resilient, techni technically resilient. We have hardware, as I mentioned in my talk, all the way through Artemis 7. And I, I spoke to uh, Dr. Butler Hine uh, for our show earlier. There's still new technology to be uh, 
invented or developed uh, new materials as, as we go through this process. It's not today's technology, but you're looking at what technology will be available into the future. That's exactly right. For our architecture, we try and keep it open at the, at the far right of it so that these technologies can be developed and help us buy down our risks, help us buy down how much we have to take with us to Mars, because every launch that we need is cost and time. Wonderful. Well, Jim Free, I've got about 20 other questions in the back of my mind, but uh, you're the Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development with NASA. It's a real pleasure and an honour to have you here in Perth, Western Australia, my Perth boy. But thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. Thank you. It was a wonderful visit. Thanks for having us.